In this segment, I will explain to you the four required sounds that must be used in all bosun calls. The first one is a low pitch. The second one is a high pitch. Third is a warbling sound similar to what a canary would make. And we'll explain later in what they are used for. The last one is a trill. The trill is forming a R sound or fluttering your tongue on the roof of your mouth, such as this. The first sound, starting by holding the bosun's call in the proper manner, is the low pitch. I am in a clenched position. I'll explain those later. It sounds like this. The next one is the high pitch, still holding it in a low form. The third is the warble, sounding like a canary, by actuating your finger from a clench, or a curve to a clench, to a curve to a clench position. The timing on warbles is subject to what call you're producing. It can be produced pretty quickly. or it can be done slowly. And the last is the trill, as we explained, forming an R or fluttering your tongue on the roof of your mouth. It is very difficult and takes extensive practice. In this segment, I'll explain the four basic calls that Sea Scouts need to be proficient in learning. All right, I'll stop torturing everyone with that. Okay. Okay, I'll give you one minute to recover your hearing. That's the bosun whistle. Anyways, so what is bosun? It's a new open source monitoring system that includes an expression language, notification templates, and a testing interface. It is written in Go and Angular, and it uses OpenTSDB as the time series database. And it's a project that includes a collector called S-Collector, and that gathers data from Linux, Windows, and can pull vSphere and uh, various SNMP network devices. Who am I? I'm Kyle Brandt. I'm the director of site reliability at Stack Exchange. It's my team's job to keep Stack Overflow online and Server Fault online so you guys can get your questions answered. Um, I'm the co-author of this monitoring system, Boson, and I wrote it with my coworker, Matt Gibson. I'm a sometimes blogger, not so much these days because I've been busy writing a monitoring system. And most importantly, I have a Twitter handle, and of course, that's what makes me special. Um, OK, let's talk about alerting. That's the thing I really want to talk about. Alerting is a hard problem. And that's because excellence in alerting means owning attention. So a quote that kind of captures this well, I think, from Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru, is as follows. The two scarce elements of our economy are trust and attention. Attention is scarce because it doesn't scale. We can't do more than one thing at a time. And the number of organizations and ideas that are competing for our attention grows daily. So when we think about this and monitoring systems, it's usually communicating us uh, with us through email. So we get too much email from coworkers, alerting systems, vendors, conferences, and spam, and it's all competing for our attention. And because we get too much of that, we start to lose trust in the monitoring system. So what we've got here is failure to communicate. We fail to communicate with the monitoring systems. The monitoring systems fail to communicate with us. They don't communicate well with their systems. It's really all a problem of communication. So how do we fix this? How do we own attention with alerts? I think there's really three, three things you need to do. And if you're doing these three things, then you're probably doing a pretty good job with alerting. The first is have a good signal to noise ratio. And to me, what that means is actionable versus unactionable alerts. So good signal, you can do something about it. Noise, it's unactionable, you can't do anything about it. 
Um, the second thing you need to do is provide people with informative notifications. So when someone actually gets an alert, it tells you the things you need to know. It gives you context. It gives you um, information about the problem, links to learn more, all of this stuff. Um, the other thing you need to do is notify the correct people and notify them in time for something to do so they have time to actually do something about the problem. I don't think we generally do that. What we do is we lose attention, and we lose attention by spamming people with uninformative alerts that are too late. However, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be spammy. From our new monitoring system, this was a morning and an afternoon's worth of alerts, four alerts, accurate alerts, things I needed to care about, as opposed to, I don't know, 50 I got from the other, our old system at the same time period. They can be informative. You can have emails that include the notes about what your intents were, um, links to relevant systems, breakdowns of kind of what this alert is about, giving you more information. Um, they also, they don't have to be too late. You can, for example, do forecasting alerts. So in this case, this is an alert I got. There's 21% free space. That's probably not a threshold you'd alert on. But there were, according to the linear regression, 6.66 days remaining, that was the actual number, um, until we hit zero space. So yes, 21% free space is fine, but if we're losing space at this velocity, we got to fix it, and six days gives us some time to fix it. Um, so we're, we're not being reactionary, because as soon as the system and team becomes reactionary, it all goes downhill from there. Um, so why do we have these problems? What are the sources of these problems? Um, one of them, I said it was spammy. Why is it spammy? I think it's spammy mainly for two reasons. Um, the ability to tune alerts in existing systems, I found to be highly limited. So most of what you can tune is just maybe the recent duration, like the last three values, and you set a constant number as the threshold, 5, 10, 15, whatever. Um, that's sometimes useful, but often fragile and requires high maintenance. And another big problem I'm going to talk about is that the development cycle for tuning alerts is just too slow. Um, it includes too much friction. You deploy a change, you wait and see if it triggers when it should, and this is an iteration cycle that takes days or weeks. And the iteration cycle for creating alerts should really be a matter of minutes, or fixing them. Um, as far as why alerts are uninformative, I think it's really two things. Access to the data when you are making your notifications is limited. You can't display all the things you want to, at least not easily and the way to manipulate the way it's displayed, um, the presentation layer, tables, graphs, et cetera, can also be limiting. Um, as far as why they're too late, I think this problem's a little bit more subtle. Um, and the image in here is from a blog post by John Alspa, which at the end of the slide I have a link to. It's a really good one you should read. And kind of why they're too late, I think, is in order to make alerts less noisy, we make them less sensitive. Um, but if we do that, then the chances are when we get them, it might be too late for us to do anything. At the opposite end of the spectrum, um, you know, you're making alerts very sensitive and then they're spam and you don't pay attention. So you kind of have this intersection of noise and signal where you have the sweet spot right there. And that sweet spot in a lot of, a lot of monitoring systems is just too, it's too small. It's hard to really define accurate conditions to get into that, that accurate signal where you're not getting noise. Um, and also forecasting generally isn't a feature, and, and it can be, it can be very useful. Lastly, there's too much maintenance, and, I, and the way I think about it is easy things are hard, hard things are easy. So easy things should be adding new hosts to your system, um, having, um, being able to change your alert without recollecting the data in a different way, and again, a slow tuning cycle, like these things don't need to be. Um, these are easy problems and they are made to be hard. Hard problems are things like defining accurate alerting conditions and that's what we should be spending our time doing. So because of all this, I think we end up giving into the noise and a lot of us give, give up. I was at um, two nights ago having dinner with some of the people at the conference and one person solved their alert noise by a Gmail filter that sends it to DevNull. Um, I don't really blame them. I think a lot of people probably do that. That's kind of the state, state of things. Um, so alerting is a hard problem, but it can be solved, I think, if we respect that it's a hard problem. So what are the building blocks to doing this? I think we need four things. We need data. You just need the raw data. That's the foundation. You need express evaluation of that data to create accurate alert conditions. You need to be able to compose informative notifications that tell people what they need to know. 
and you need to be able to iterate fast. You need to be able to test and do this again and speed up the, the rate of our alert development. So data. Data to me means a complete time series, not just the last few values. And a time series is just observation and timestamps. That's what all it is. Any graph you look at is usually a time series um, in the monitoring world. And the reason you need that is because it's the system's history. And history is what gives you context for a system. It's, you know, how is it now compared to what it used to be? That's part of context. And from context, you get two things. The ability to trigger more accurate alert conditions and the ability to provide that context in the notifications and make them informative. So expressive formulas do not look like drop-down boxes. If that's what you have, it's not expressive. If you say the last two values are greater than this number, it's just not powerful enough. Um, so we need a language that lets you at the very minimum change the duration, change the reduction function we use to reduce a time series to a single number because a single number, true, false, is eventually what's going to ultimately decide whether alert is sent or not. It's a, it's a, it's a true, false decision. I'm going to send alert about this or I'm not. Um, expressive notifications. If you're printfing strings to mail X, yeah, you can do some pretty good things. If you're a hacker, it's all right, but it's really kind of old, I think. So develop administrators, what I, they use real templates. And you only really need to know two things for that, HTML and a templating language. And templating languages, I think, are becoming more and more familiar to us because they're used in config management. For instance, Puppet, you have the ERB templates. Um, testing, I've been talking about testing. I don't really, I just haven't seen much testing in alert systems. Maybe it's a thing, I haven't found it. Um, and I think testing is critical. It needs to be there. Um, and why is that? So a lot of you have start, probably heard about the OODA loop already. Um, it it's originally was for the military, but it's become very popular in operations. And it's really about decision making. And it has four high level stages. One, you observe things. You observe your data, your situation. You orient yourself. You interpret that. You decide what the meaning of that is. You decide what you're going to do about it, and then you actually do the thing. Then you observe the results of that. You orient, you decide, you act. And the idea is the faster you can go through this loop, the better off you are. And this applies to all sorts of things we do. You can think about it during like on-call emergencies and stuff like that. Um, it's a very useful just framework, simple tool um, for, for a lot of the stuff we do. So what about when we apply it to alerting? We want to be able to iterate fast. So we need to be able to test results against history. That's our, that's our observation. That's the thing we can observe. We need to orient ourselves. So we look at those results. We drill down. And as we do that, we decide if they're noise or if they're actual proper signal. Then you need to decide on how you're going to tune alert, how you're going to change it to get rid of that noise. And then you act, you tune it, and you run it again, and you see if your observation had the result, and you iterate and you iterate, and this should be done over minutes. Um, so this is what it looks like in Boson, uh, testing alerts against history. You set a start time, an end time, how frequently you want this alert to run, and you get this timeline here. It's, it's hard to read, but each one of those objects is a web server, and then going across is time. Red means it's critical, green means it's good, red bad, green good, we're very used to that. So what you can do is you can tune your alert, you rerun it, and you see what it looks like. Now we have more green, so we must be good. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. But this is something you can do in the interface and you do fast. And that means you're developing your alerts faster, which means you're getting less noise. So testing means you can design alerts to be more accurate before they go into production. That means you're not getting a lot of spam and reacting to spam from the initial get-go. Um, you can also spend more time fixing the hard things and less time on easy things like restarting Nagios and waiting for the thing to update and maybe waiting a few days. Like that, that shouldn't be a problem. And there's also less friction in going and actually correcting alerts that are noise. And that's really important because when things are easy, they get done. When there's lots of friction and things are hard, they don't get done. That's human nature. Um, you know, discipline can counteract some of that, but that tends to be human nature. So once you have the, the four things I talked about, data, an expression language, notification templates, and testing, what are some of the things you can do? You can combine metrics, i.e. the ratio of one metric to another. You can make time span a facet of tuning. You can do thresholds based on history, so sort of this idea of anomaly detection. 
You can alert at various scopes. I'll talk about this a little bit more, but should it be a host, subsystem, cluster, components of a service, all these sort of things. Um, you can use statistical reduction functions to kind of act more accurately express what you're after, such as min, percentile, mediation, um, median, sorry, deviations. Um, you can do relative thresholds. Is one thing in this cluster significantly greater than the other? Uh, you can do Boolean conditions. Don't alert when, you know, CPU is high, but something else is going on, because when that happens, I know it's high. So normally what we do now is we just, we see that alert and we mentally filter it and say, oh, I know that's not a problem, but we shouldn't be doing that. The system should be doing that. And there's a lot more things you can do, but the font's kind of small and I'm running out of breath. So let's get into some examples. Um, so you can have formulas that combine metrics. In this example, we have HA proxy. Um, HA proxy by itself from the CSV file gives us two pieces of information that are useful. Uh, one of them is how many current sessions you have for your front end, for example, and another is what the set limit is. Um, and in order to learn on this, we probably want a utilization percentage, right? But it's not giving us to that. So as opposed to actually going and having to modify our collector, we, we could just in our expression language say, you know, give me the current sessions for all of my instances of things and give me the session limit for all those instances of things and line up those instances and give me the utilization percentage. So when I have an idea for a new alert or something like this I want to set up, it's not going and changing my collector, it's just going into the interface, redefining the alert and testing it. Um, time, span, time span can be a facet of tuning and this can be kind of interesting. So this alert here, the idea is um, at Stack Exchange, people um, sometimes accidentally leave Puppet disabled. You just, there's that command, you say disable, reason, and you forget to re-enable it when you're done. So what this alert says that pu if Puppet has been consistently disabled for 24 hours, meaning it was never enabled again during that period, then send an alert um, because someone probably forgot about the fact that they had disabled it. And you do that by we have this puppet disabled and one equals true in that it is disabled. Zero means it wasn't disabled. So if you take the minimum of the entire time series and that's always been greater than zero, that means it's been consistently disabled the whole time. Uh, another Boolean example is don't alert on swapping if there happens to be a high mail queue. So at Stack Exchange we have these newsletters and we dump them all onto the mail server as fast as we can because, well, that's just what we do. Whatever, it may not be the best thing, but it's what we do. They're not time sensitive. When we dump thousands and thousands of emails, the system starts swapping. I don't care. It's not important. So I don't have to write a new alert that's just for my mail servers and overrides the other one. I just add this condition to my alert and say, if there's a mail queue and it's high, don't alert. And if there is no mail queue, pretend there is one and it isn't high, so it's not true. Um, another Boolean example, um, bonding, when you take two or teaming, whatever you want to call it, you have multiple network interfaces. I want to alert on this in a couple of ways. Um, I want to be able to say if any of the slaves are bad or if there's only one slave, because if this has been configured with only one slave, then I don't have redundancy on the network for this machine. So the way I do that is I have the slave status and ours the healthy count less than the actual are the unhealthy count, is that less than the slave count, or is there less than two slaves in my bond? And if that's true, send an alert, and only send an alert by host. Don't send one for each network interface. Um, so what about alerting on anomalies? This is kind of interesting. Um, there's more and more talk about, these, about this these days. One of the problems is it can be noisy. But, um, so alerts on anomaly, the idea is you look at the history of the thing. So this is, again, why you need a full time series. You go back and you look at it and you say, is what it doing now deviate significantly from what it was doing? Like, is, is something going on that maybe I should be aware of? And the reason it's important is sometimes it's the only practical option. So, for example, at uh, Stack Exchange, we track performance per web route. So a web route is, for instance, our web application, show all the users, or ask a question, or view questions for this tag. These are all different routes. There are thousands of them. So it's not really feasible for me to go and set a static threshold for every single route and maintain that. It's just not practical. So what I can do is start to do this anomaly detection where I look at the history and compare it to the current values and see if it deviates. And I can even tune that some more. So I gather the history, and the way I gather history is our traffic is like a lot of websites. You have a couple of bumps during the day for 
you know, the United States, Europe, and then Asia when their traffic picks up, and then we're a little bit lower on weekend, very typical web pattern. So when I look at history, I say, right now is this half hour. Go and look at the same half hour a week ago, seven days ago, and do that a few times, go back. So then I kind of have the sample of what traffic is normally like for this particular web route at this time of the week. Um, and then based on that history, I take the median and the deviation. Um, this, this method does have some problems, but it's a start and it works. Um, and then I take the difference between the two medians and I say, all right, so warn if the current median is greater than the past median plus a couple deviations of the history. And I also don't want an alert unless it's more than a 10 millisecond difference. Like that's just the threshold I decided to care about. And if this route does not make up more than 1% of my traffic, then um, don't alert me about that either because that's just below the threshold I have time to care about right now. So in the expression language, you can define all these things to really get the alerts that you care about. Um, I talked about scope. So scope is really about the number of notifications you get per event, the number of emails you get per event. Most monitoring systems um, instantiate on metric plus host or something like um, metric plus service plus host. It's all very tied together. You can think of this as like a SQL group by statements where the group by statement is mandatory. So the way to fix this, the way to get flexibility is to make these things orthogonal so your metrics and objects are not tied together and your objects are not necessarily tied to your alerting scope. Um, this is a little bit confusing so I'm going to illustrate it because it's just it's easier to understand that way. Um, sorry, this is a little small, it's hard to read, but um, as an example, I'm going to use a simplified version of uh, Stack Exchange's HA proxy setup, which is our load balancers. So we have two data centers, one in New York, one in Oregon. Each one of those is like a failover group, which has two hosts. Each one of those hosts has multiple HA proxy instances running in it. Each one of those HA proxy instances has multiple front ends and multiple back ends, and those back ends have multiple servers. So it's kind of like just drill, drill, drill down, and you just drill down, you get more and more things. So if I alert on a host scope, then I'm going to get four possible alerts if all my host goes down or, or whatever, as, whatever aspect I'm monitoring goes down per host. If I do it by tier and I can spam multiple hosts, I can cut this whatever way is appropriate for my environment, I would get three possible alerts. If I do it by tier and host, then I'm going to get 12 of them. If I do it um, per server, then I'm going to have like end servers, end backends, end hosts, end tiers, and that's just going to be a crap load of alerts. Like one thing could go wrong and I'm going to get 40 emails or something like that, and that's what we want to fix. Backing out again, I could do one per cluster, which is two possible alerts, or I could do the whole service, which is one possible alert. Um, so as an example here, here's treating it as one, one whole service. And what this alert, what this alert triggers on, um, triggers on a few things, but in particular, um, if, a, if a server has been down as far as HA proxy is concerned for more than two or five minutes, um, I want an alert about that. So in this example, I don't know if you can read it, but all the, the servers OR Apache O2 in every single case. But there, that is true of multiple load balancer servers and multiple backends. So as opposed to getting four alerts, I get one notification with the breakdown of the information in it. So scope in a nutshell, broader scope means less notifications, but more information must be included in the notification. There's no correct universal scope. I can't tell you what your scope is. I don't know your environment. No one does. The product can't tell you that. But what, what you can do is give, give the operators flexibility to tune their scope um, fluently and to their needs. Um, and when you do that, when you get an accurate scope, you get less alert noise because you're getting less emails per, per event. Um, another more simple example of this is just hardware. So I don't have like 10 alerts for every single facet of hardware per host. It's one alert per host and if the status of anything is bad, it triggers the alert and then in the notification, I get breakdowns of the status and I also include other useful information like the service tag, what the model number is, what the operating system is. These are basically all the things Dell's going to ask you when you call and say your thing is broken. So you can just get this email and you're on the can and you can call Dell from the can and it's wonderful. Um, so what is the point of all these examples? Your creativity should be the limiting factor, not the monitoring system. So too often the monitoring system drives the way we do monitoring 
where in reality we should be dictating the way monitoring is done because we know our environments, the authors of the monitoring system don't. Um, so our system, I want to start to take a closer look at it because the idea is it's an implementation that solves these problems. Um, and we've had good success with it so far. It was open sourced a couple days ago, so it's new, it's still growing. Um, so the first thing I want to do is look at the workflow from just the interface perspective. And it's kind of why I call it an alerting IDE. Um, the first thing you do is you graph some expression. That graph gives you an expression which lets you reduce these time series to single numbers or other things like that. You can then build up a rule where you use things like variables and you can start to tune your notification to look the way you want it to look. Um, and finally, you can test this and see things like that timeline or what this notification is going to look like in your email. And you can do this all in the interface and that's what kind of gives you this rapid development cycle. And here's kind of what it looks like. We have a graphing interface. You graph something and once you graph, graph a time series, you get the query expression down at the bottom. You can click a link and that populates the expression page. Um, each query is going to return, depending on how you write it, but generally it's going to return multiple objects and a time series for each object. Um, you can't alert on that because an alert needs to be um, true-false, right? Eventually you need to get it down to a single number, a scalar. Um, so the way we do that is you add a reduction function, such as median. Median takes a bunch of numbers and turns it into a single number. Once you've done something like this, it'll link you to the rule page. The rule page, you can do lots of stuff. You can test it against history. You can experiment with different um, reduction functions. You can use variables. They're actually just string replacements. Um, you can start to define things that you're then only going to use in your notification template. So your notifications can include information that weren't necessarily directly part of the trigger rule because they still might provide context, things you want to know about. Um, and the notification template, you can have some notes. That's important. I think every alert should have some notes that say, hey, this is why I wrote this alert. This is some of the, you know, the, the caveats of the alert. You can add some graphs. Um, you can play around with scope like I was talking about, and you can include other queries that allow you to provide supplemental information to help provide context for the person. The interface, it's hard to display because it's, it's fairly big, but it looks like this. You have your alert definition, you have your template definition, and then at the bottom you'll have that timeline that I showed of when things are triggering or a preview of the email. Um, so a simple alert looks something like this. You define alert, you hook it up to a template, you do some queries, and these are open TSDB queries. So one of them is dropped packets per host. Another one is dropped packets by host plus interface plus direction in or out. Um, and then I can do a graph by interface to kind of a different query that's going to be just per interface. So now I have host scope, I have interface plus direction scope, and I have just interface scope. All these things can be shown in my notification. And if there are dropped packets over a certain period of time, five minutes, um, I'll alert on that. Um, and you could make that less sensitive with percentiles and other thresholds or based on history, whatever you want to do. And then the template, you have some HTML and some curly braces to use functions and reference variables. And what that ends up producing is alert like this. You have some stats at the top. It's hard to read, sorry, but it tells you median, total, max. You then have a breakdown that's going to show you each interface and then whether it was in or out and how many dropped packets. So a piece of information we can glean from this is that we were only dropping packets for stuff coming in, not going out for every interface. And we can also see that multiple interfaces were involved in this event. And then the graph kind of shows you when this started and also, again, that it was multiple interfaces. So this is what I mean by providing context. All this stuff can um, be in, in a single notification as opposed to getting a whole bunch of ones for every interface. And then you can kind of read this all at once and it's less mental load on the operator to interpret event when they're waking up in the middle of the night and they're tired. Um, the architecture of this, so we have an agent called S collector. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. We also have um, Boson, that's the whole monitoring system with this interface. Data gets sent to Boson. Boson processes it through the rules. It gathers some relational information and stores it about your metrics and it passes it on to OpenTSDB. And then we have a scheduler that's running these alerts every so often. Um, you can set the evaluation frequency and it queries OpenTSDB using those alerts and gets the data back. Um, and there's also the web interface. 
One thing to note is the web interface is based entirely on API calls. So there's nothing in the web interface that you can't do through uh, REST API calls. So that makes this kind of extensible so you can maybe fit into your environment better. Um, S collectors are our agent that gathers data. It has lots of built-in collectors. Um, it auto discovers applications like Redis, IS, SQL Server, MySQL, and that's very important. So basically you have this thing running and I don't say, hey, go monitor Redis. It says, oh, there's Redis on the server now. I'm going to monitor that and start sending data. And if you've designed your alerts to apply to any old Redis instance, which you can do, then you get the alerting for free. And what this does is it takes out a lot of the human error. I imagine a lot of you have had the experience where you didn't get an alert just because nobody actually set up the monitoring, and that's, that's stupid. That should not be a reason for not getting alerts. There's plenty of reasons to not get alerts. One of them should not be that someone just forgot to go through that step. And you shouldn't have to go through that step. It's kind of a waste of time. Um, with this, it's built in Go, so it compiles to a binary. Stack Exchange is a Windows and a Linux shop, which means they are both important to us. Um, we can't treat either one of them as second class citizens, so in Windows, we're going deep into WMI raw performance counters. In Linux, we're going to proc. We're getting the data as best we can from both systems. Um, and it's a single binary, so no library dependencies, none of that. You don't need to have Ruby or Python installed or the right version of either of those. Um, when Boson can't be reached during a network event, this agent will queue up data to a certain amount of memory. That's very useful because if you have kind of a short-lived network outage, you don't know what happened necessarily, but because this queues data, once the network outage ends, it'll send all that data and catch up and then you can go back and look at what happened. So kind of for, this can be very useful for just forensic evidence for when you've had something go bad and you're trying to look back and figure out what it was. Um, we prefer counters. Um, I just feel like every monitoring talk should reiterate this. Counters are numbers that keep increasing and then you can later derive the rate from that. That has two distinct advantages that I can think of. One of them is that you're not really losing information between polls. You might lose the shape of the data, but you're not actually losing the quantity of the data that happened between those two, two pollings or two samplings. The other important thing is it gets rid of the risk of aliasing. So aliasing is like if you have a curve like this that goes up and down and you happen to always be monitoring at a fixed rate, you might always be hitting the bottom of that curve which makes it look like this thing has been zero the whole time, when in truth it was maybe spiking up and it's, the, you know, the average or something is higher, but you miss that because of your, the way that your frequency of polling happened to interact with, um, with the way the data was behaving. Other things, it sends metadata about anything it collects, so it's gonna tell you the unit, like is this milliseconds, is this HTTP hits, is this the amount of dogs that are in the office, whatever you feel like monitoring. Um, it tells you a description, so you actually can know what the hell this metric is about. And it tells you the type of metric, if it's a counter or a gauge, so you don't need to figure that out when you query it. Um, it can run external collectors, so you can plop a script in a directory and just print some text, and this thing will scrape it up and um, use the queue and use the sending, so it's an easy way to start monitoring more information without actually having to know go or change change submit a PR to change S collector. Uh, like I said, it's a binary, so no required libraries. And by default, we're collecting most things every 15 seconds, so we can get a, a reasonably high, high amount of information from each server. Um, obviously, that's all relative, but compared to one minute or five minutes, it's certainly a much higher frequency. Um, we store the time series in OpenTSDB, which is an open source um, uh, time series database. Um, I like it for a few reasons. It's extremely storage efficient. So my plan is to never roll up data. That's one of the things that turned me off from Graphite. So we send about 15,000 data points a second currently to the system, and that grows unreplicated about three gigabytes a day. That means that we're never gonna roll up the data. We, with the three servers we bought, that's gonna buy us space for the next couple of years, and when it's time to add more, we just buy two more servers, because HBase is supposed to be an odd number, of, <laughs> odd number of servers, and that'll get us X more time. Um, it seems to be fast, graphing is it's responsive, these alerts run fast, and HBase, from what I've gathered, is a scalable system, so that helps us out there. Um, it integrates, I might be lying, but there were screenshots from my chat room. It integrates with OpServer, another open source project that we did related to monitoring. Um, and OpServer provides you a very fine dashboard. Um, 
very impressive with SQL Server. If any of you use Microsoft SQL Server, go check this out. You can view top queries, execution plans, all this sort of stuff. We also have some nice things in there like HA proxy administration, take servers out of rotation, Redis views, Elastic views, stuff like this. Um, so from all doing this over the past year, what have I learned about alerting best practices? Not really enough. I kind of need the help from the community to start playing with this thing and help figure some things out because I think we're just kind of starting to learn what some of the things we should be doing are. A few things I've learned though, um, only try to have one alert per object. Don't do like a forecast alert and a threshold alert for a disk is two separate alerts. You can use both those pieces of logic in one alert to decide whether a trigger or not, but you don't want two alerts for the same thing. You always want to try to get one alert per event. Um, I don't see any way around discipline to tune alerts and silence things during maintenance. You still need to do this. The way we can do it is have APIs to make silencing easy and tuning alerts to be a faster workflow. Again, easy things get done, hard things get procrastinated. Um, and the other thing, this, this is tricky, um, but when you compose an alert, try to think of how the person that's going to be viewing the alert is going to be seeing it. So you want to think about things like um, include notes, say why you wrote this alert, say what the point of it is, include links to relevant documentation or dashboards, include the units. So when people see that this went to 10 to 20, 10 to 20 what is always going to be a question. So try to put yourself, try to have some empathy and put yourself in the shoes of, you know, the person who would be receiving this alert and pretend it's, you didn't write it, so you wrote it, you know it, but other people might not. Um, I really want all your guys' help. I want you guys to check out the system. I want your creativity in designing alerts. I want to find bugs and what needs documenting because it's confusing. We need contributors. Um, if you know you have that Magpie developer that's just itching to do Go and likes monitoring, please point them to this to this project and they might be able to help us out. Um, S collector contributors, that won't be as involved. You could just write some collectors because at Stack Exchange, we're only going to write collectors for things we have, um, but I'm sure other people have other things, so that would be a great, great opportunity for contributions. And uh, Stack Exchange is hiring. Come work with me. Um, it's a fun place to work. They flew me out here, paid for my hotel. They're flying me home. Um, you get to work with great people. Tom Lomicelli's on my team. George Beach is on my team, who gave a talk earlier. Both of them have gave talks here. Um, so it's a fun place to work, so consider applying, please. Uh, we have both remote and New York positions open. Um, go try Boson. Um, we have boson.org is the website. It has a getting started guide. All this stuff is in a Docker image, so if you can run Docker, you can start to try this. You don't have to go and build your own HBase open TSDB cluster and figure out how to build Go. It all just, just spin up your Docker instance and you can start playing with it. If you want to start monitoring more hosts besides that one, you can go and download the binaries for S Collector and just throw them on a Windows and Linux host and see what it looks like. Um, and tell us what's broken and write more creative alerts. Um, and also just, um, oh, you want to take, go ahead, take a picture. Cool. All right. And lastly, some recommended reading. Uh, two things. I mentioned John Allspaugh's post, Owning Attention and Considerations for Alert Design. Great post. Go read it. Um, he really touches on a lot of the subtleties here and gets you thinking about it. Um, and also the monitoring chapters of Tom's new book, The Practice in Cloud. System administration is very good. It includes some general languages, some of the um, like diagrams and stuff that Kasky talked about last year from his framework for monitoring talk. Um, and the book in general is, is good. That's all I've got. So questions about this, this system, please. Oops, someone's getting up. Hi. Um, great talk. Very interesting. Um, it looked like... Um, it looked like a lot of the uh, the expressions that you were using uh, for deciding, you know, is this an alert, is this not, they were uh, sort of functional. And I'm not a programmer, so I'm probably using mm -hmm. that the wrong way, but not explicit if, else, you know, then, that sort of thing. Is that deliberate? And if so, why? What's the benefit? Well, so what we're taking is a bunch of time series, and eventually we're reducing them to a condition. So the functional, the, the functional aspects really just make it easy to, to do that, to reduce these to the numbers. And then if kind of the if else statements, you know, you can always represent them with just and or, right? It's the same thing. So by doing that, 
and the amount of normally what I found is you only are going to have so many so many conditions combined before you want to send an alert. So the if then syntax is going to be kind of long, where if you just do this and this or this or something like that and put in parentheses, it's it's pretty clear, it's pretty easy to read, and it just keeps it nice and compact. Okay. Thanks very much. So, so did you evaluate any other time series stores like Influx or, or you know, comparison to OpenTSDB? Yep. So one, one of the things I really wanted was that infinite retention of never rolling data up, like I said. Um, that pretty much threw graphite out the window. To do that with graphite, I think as opposed to growing three gigs a day, I'd probably be growing 30 or more um, based on everyone's data estimates I got. Because it's, and it's not its fault, it's designed to roll up data, that's its point. Um, in FluxDB, we started working on this project a year ago, and it was just announced. And then um, both Matt and I talked to Paul Dix at GopherCon back in March or something. But by that time, we were so integrated into OpenTSDB, it just, it didn't make sense for us to take a step back and rewrite all this stuff at this stage. Also, I got the impression that Influx would be using quite a bit of space, too, to keep kind of the frequency and resolution of data that I was after. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, very interesting. Uh, a few things. First of all, how does it keep track of changes to its configuration so that if I define an alert and then a few days later someone changes the threshold of that alert, can I go back and look at the history of all the changes to that alert? And also, how does this integrate into, you know, so uh, I think uh, like an important thing for the monitoring system I've been working on for the past year is that it's all configurable from configuration management mm -hmm. so that you define your, your, your checks like with the service, and this looks very sort of web oriented, but it also has a API, a RESTful API. It's just wondering how you could do that integration, or if that's possible. Yes. So, sorry. The first question again was history of configuration. History of configuration. Everything is stored in a text file currently because that was one of the most important things to us. More important than being able to. So you saw like there was that GUI where right. you edit the configuration. Right. Um, you have to copy and paste that currently into your configuration. I see. And then we have a test config page. And then when you're done, it's good. You check it in the Git. In our environment, once it sees that a Git check-in has been done, it builds. Because you're right, it's very important to have revision history. Um, as far as updating the alerts with configuration management, um, this is kind of a different paradigm, because when you write a query like os.cpu and you say host equals star, right. that's going to instantiate into a, like an alert instance right. for every single host. So when you add a new host to your environment, you don't update your configuration. Just like when there's a new Redis instance, you don't update your configuration usually. It just sees that there's this new data, this new object, and your alerts, if they're correctly written, will apply to this new thing. So that's just not, we just basically, as opposed to figuring out how do we integrate this with the configuration management, we just deleted that problem. Okay. I was, I was curious why you chose the, the pull model for data collection, I mean the push model rather than the pull model for data collection. Um, we found better luck with the, with the, with the pull model where you, where you go and grab the, grab the raw file off of some local disk on the, on the remote machine. And, and pull it into your pull it into the alert system. Um, I, I I sort of don't care that much um, push versus pull, but the main thing is when we do the agent approach. Um, oh, just if anyone's scared about the agent, sorry, a little tangent. We um, that data queue is memory bound, and we have another memory check. It checks itself, and if it's above a certain threshold, it'll panic and kill itself. Um, we actually haven't had that problem, but we put that protection mechanism in there because I know agents are scary. Um, when you have an agent on the host, it's, it's very easy to get to the data. So for instance, in Linux, I can just cat proc files. I can run commands, and I don't have to worry about translating that through SSH or the overhead of SSH spinning up every time. In Windows, I can just have a native thing that's querying WMI and I don't need to worry about having a WMI proxy or getting, getting the authentication of WMI between machines, which can be a pain. So what I, the main thing I found is that it really reduces um, the amount of, of trouble to collect new data. And the other big piece of it um, goes back to what I was just saying. 
I don't want to have to tell my system to go monitor new things. So this agent gets deployed with our builds. The builds discover all the relevant um, services that are running on that and start sending data to the system. So polling models essentially means, uh, say, go pull these servers for this sort of thing. I don't want to do that. I just want that all to be automatic so I can focus on writing my alerts and looking at the data. Thank you. You're welcome. Question about uh, aggregation host. Is there any features, do you guys have any, any features right now to be able to provide, um, say you have 50 data centers and you want to be able to kind of separate out so your master collector doesn't get overwhelmed by all these um, aggregate information coming in. So is there a way to have an aggregator in each location that would collect that and then summarize it and push down? Um. Okay, so there's kind of kind of two things there. One of them is um, the problem of m multiple geographic data centers, right? Which is always a tricky thing. We have a couple ideas of how we want to do that, but we haven't solved that yet. Um, the other thing you're talking about is aggregation. That's actually one of the strong points of OpenTSDB. So OpenTSDB is metric based, and then you have these tags. And a tag might be host, for example. So if I leave that tag blank, the value for that blank, it's going to automatically aggregate with whatever aggregation function I provided. So for instance, sum is going to show me the sums. And if I want to do that by data center, I would just start adding a DC tag to everything. Um, sometimes you don't want to, like that's the right way to structure your data because that's usually how you want to view it in dashboards and that's 90% of the time on how you want to alert on it. When you don't, that other 10% in our expression language, we have this transpose function, which takes groups and kind of swaps them, and then you can reduce them into to a series of numbers. Um, that's, that's more clear in the documentation on boson.org, but um, essentially, yeah, there's all sorts of ways you can aggregate things, and that's part of what feeds into scope. Like, should alerts be per host? Should they be per data center? Should they be per cluster? And people may have their ideas about what it should be, but they're all wrong. They're only right for them because everyone does something different. So it's, we've tried to make that, design the system in a way that you can send, you can tag your data the way is appropriate for your environment. And then also in the alerting system, you can work around those, those sort of groupings when you want to do other groupings that are maybe less frequent. Thanks. Sure. So two, two related questions, I guess. Uh, first, is this, I, I get the feeling that this is intended to be a single shared service across you know, however many possible different services that you have in your organization, as opposed to running a separate one per organization. Yeah. And uh, the second related one to that is, how far does this scale? Um, presumably, if this is a single hosted, uh, uh, put on a single host, there's a limit to how much CPU you can give to actually evaluating conditions and so on. How many hosts can this, or how many metrics can this deal with? Um, as far, oh, most of the, the limiting factor there is going to be OpenTSDB. Um, and OpenTSDB, their main thing is to be able to scale very high. So I said I was putting in 15,000 data points per second. There are definitely organizations that are putting in millions of data points per second. So it scales very high. Um, as far as you, you were asking, how many hosts does it scale to? Um, Boson itself, as we relay all this data, is showing very little CPU usage. Um, the amount of um, kind of query load is very fast. We have, I don't know, a couple hundred hosts and it'll run through all these alert rules over like 20 seconds or something like that. And some of those are forecasts where it's got to go and get a bunch of history. If you have thousands and thousands of hosts, the one problem I'm aware of right now is that when you do like host equals star for CPU, our web interface is going to show all of those. So the actual limitation is going to be that you're just going to blow up your browser right now. We will hopefully have that fixed by like next week or something. We just, we had other priorities this week, but that's not long off. So. <laughs> Basically, how well, how big does this scale? I don't know. It scales to what we're doing at Stack Exchange perfectly well. We need some people to try it out with some bigger installations to, to see what it can do. 
Uh, I would expect that most of us are here because there's not a lot of love for Nagios in this room. So the question I would have is, I mean, how, do you guys have any, how well does this translate? Like basically, you know, the question I'm going to get is, how can I move from Nagios to Boston? So is that something that you guys have prepared at all or... It's, it's so different from Nagios um, in so many ways. So Nagios is often kind of the one alert per thing, and you have to change the way you collect data to change your alerts. This separates those. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the ideas, like escalation and warning to critical, the things that people, I think, feel Nagios got right, is we still do all that stuff. Um, I think the main thing is to, is to accept that you're going to have to learn this expression language. That might take you a couple of days. Learn the templating language to really make refined alerts. Um, so if you accept the learning curve, because I think we made so many other things easy, like giving the agent, so you just get all the data out the bat and stuff like that, that the transition shouldn't be too bad if, if, if you guys are serious about monitoring. And, Nagios can pretty much do all this stuff um, except the historical testing. Not, not having it based on a time series database eliminates possibilities, but people I know have used Nagios to, to run commands that then query Graphite or then query open TSDB. So you could do that. I don't recommend it because that's just such a hassle. And again, one of the things I think that is so important is that rapid iteration cycle. So if you're having to do stuff like that, it becomes such a pain in the ass that unless you're really disciplined, chances are the alert noise is going to creep in faster and faster. It's hard to stay on top of it. I had a similar question. Like, is it possible to uh, integrate uh, it with uh, the Nagios performance data? So if you already have a lot of checks in Nagios that are reporting performance data, is there an easy way to get it? into Boson, are there any plugins? And then a second question was, are you going to uh, support any other agents, for instance, maybe Collect T? Because if you already have Collect T running on the system, why would we then still need to install uh, the S collector, I think? So, um, the, it's up for the metadata. Um, Boson takes the exact same input format of data as OpenTSDB does which is just a timestamp, a metric, some tags, and a value. That's it, and it's JSON. So it's like a little JSON blob. So it's very easy to send data into this. So the one thing you might have to think about is what should be tags and what should be the metric, but hooking up to the performance data, writing a script to do that, and then start sending data to Boson, um, I can't imagine that being a very hard project. I, I kind of wouldn't recommend it. Um, because you're just adding another piece, maybe as a transitionary thing, but like as, a, as kind of a long-term goal, I would be looking to yank out, yank that out and start to, start to do your own thing. And same thing with Collecti. Like I said, it's a JSON endpoint, and a lot of our applications at Stack Exchange will just send, you know, our web applications are sending data directly to Boson. They're not using S Collector, because it's just, it's JSON. It's not, it's very easy to construct. So getting, basically getting data into the system is not hard, and that's one of those things. Easy things should not be hard. And that's one of the things that I think is pretty easy. Sending data to a system should be easy. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's, oh, someone's getting up. No, they're just leaving. They're bored. Okay, cool. Well, I'll be around for another day. If anyone wants to ask me more about this, I'd be more than happy to talk about it. Boston.org is the website. You can see some more examples. You can get the Docker image. Um, and that S collector agent. This is all MIT license. It's all open source. Um, so have fun. Go play. And thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>